Good morning, everybody. We are so glad you've joined us this morning to celebrate Easter, to celebrate that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He is our risen King who is with us now. He's alive and he loves us. And uh, we're going to worship him. But before we do, let me read to you uh, an anonymous prayer from this book, The Valley of Vision. Uh, this is an anonymous prayer titled Resurrection. Uh, and there's there's a lot of theology, even in just the first little sentence, um, but it's a great little prayer. Here it is. O God of my exodus, great was the joy of Israel's sons when Egypt died upon the shore. Far greater the joy when the Redeemer's foe lay crushed in the dust. He's talking about the serpent in Genesis 3.15. Jesus strides forth as the victor, conqueror of death, hell, and all opposing might. He bursts the bands of death, tramples the powers of darkness down, and lives forever. He, my gracious, gracious surety, apprehended for payment of my debt, comes forth from the prison house of the grave, free and triumphant over sin, Satan, and death. Show me herein, Father God, the proof that his vicarious offering is accepted, that the claims of justice are satisfied, that the devil's scepter is shivered, that his wrongful throne is leveled. Give me the assurance that in Christ I died. In him I rose. In his life I live. In his victory I triumph. In his ascension I shall be glorified. Amen. What a great little prayer. Let's enter into worship now. us. 
pray for us and also pray for our offering. Lord God, you have so generously blessed us, Lord, in more ways than we know. And Lord God, you are a cheerful giver, Lord, and we just ask, especially now as we give of our offerings, that we would be like you, that you would make us like you, that you would make us cheerful givers. Lord, that you would make us desire to be a blessing to others for your glory, Lord God. God, I just pray that you would bless our church, that you would set us on mission, Lord God, to make more worshipers of you, Lord. Again, for your glory alone, Lord, we ask this in your precious name. Amen.
Jesus, you are all glorious, all beautiful, all wonderful, all holy, all good, all loving, all compassionate, all gracious, all merciful, all prayerful before the throne of God, interceding for us, Jesus. We exalt you, Jesus. We crown you with many crowns, Jesus. We proclaim you as our God, our Savior, Jesus, and no other. Lord, I pray for Pastor Dan as he comes and preaches to us now. Holy Spirit, that you would speak through him in a powerful way. May he speak with conviction and power. And may you be honored through his preaching and worshipped through his preaching. By us, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Hey, good morning, Cedar Home. Happy Easter. So good to see all of you guys. Well, I can't really see you, but I know that you are there. I'm trusting that you're watching online, and I'm so thankful that we get to be together to celebrate the Lord's resurrection today. You know, I was on the phone with my dad this week and I told him, I think this is the first time in my whole life uh, that I haven't gathered with other Christians physically on Easter Sunday. It's a strange time, isn't it? Um, the world around us right now smells of death. The, the world around us smells us of, of fear and smells of anxiety and and there is no message that the world needs to hear more right now than the great news that Jesus Christ has conquered death. Uh, Jesus invites everyone who, who's afraid of death to come to him and to trust in him and to join him in his victory over death. What great news we have to celebrate today, that being united to Jesus Christ is our hope Jesus is our living hope, and in Christ we have conquered death too. You know, this week a study came out from the University of Copenhagen, and uh, it revealed that over the past uh, month, 
in 75 countries around the world, internet searches for prayer has surged to the highest level in five years. Wow. So, so it appears that one of the ways that God is redeeming this coronavirus crisis is by waking up people to their need for God and waking up people to their need to be at peace with God, waking up people to their need for hope for life after this life on earth. As C.S. Lewis, uh, the famous author, wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures. God speaks to us in our consciences, but God shouts in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Well, what sweet news it is that the message that God shouts to us in our pain is that we need him and that he is there for us. In love, he has come for us in the person of Jesus Christ who died but after three days, he rose again in victory over death. In the eyewitness account of Jesus' resurrection that we're going to look at today, the author uses the word behold five times. Behold is the little Greek word edu. Edu. Can you say that? Edu. And uh, it's a really important little word in today's passage. And it means look or see or check this out. Or in Dan Halleck's translation, dude, dude, look at this. <laughs> the reason that the author Matthew writes this word behold so many times in today's passage is because he wants us to experience the same jaw dropping awe that the people who saw these things experienced. So to the best of his ability, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Matthew is trying to say in his own words, you guys, Jesus' resurrection was mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing. You've got to get a hold of this thing. This is incredible. And also, Matthew wants us to know that the awesome power of the resurrected Jesus is not limited to the pages of ancient Scripture. The, the awesome power of the resurrected Jesus is active right now because Jesus is still alive right now. And Jesus invites you and he invites me to know him personally and to follow him and to rest in his grace right now because in him we too have conquered death. So this morning we're going to look at Matthew 28 verses 1 to 20 together. And we're going to look at the five times that the word behold appears, edu. And we're going to identify five amazing things that God wants us to behold in Matthew's account of Jesus' resurrection. So if you have a Bible with you, or if you have a Bible app on your phone, I encourage you to turn with me to Matthew 28, verse 1. And I'm going to do that too. Okay, now before we read, let's, um, let's ask the Lord, our living Lord Jesus, to help us now by his spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that uh, you have risen from the dead. We want to celebrate you and worship you today. Thank you that you did this for the glory of God and for the joy of all who trust in you. Thank you that for those of us who are united to you through faith, we too have died and have been risen again to new life in you. I pray, Lord, that you would use this word today to encourage us uh, who know you and to those who don't, that they might see this hope that is available to them in Jesus Christ and that they would trust in Jesus too. Thanks so much, God, for this time we have together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's start here by reading Matthew 28, 1 to 6. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. 
And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. So it's really fascinating who came to Jesus' tomb first on Sunday morning and why they came. You know, it was not Jesus' 12 disciples who rose early and went to his tomb. No, almost all of Jesus' 12 disciples had abandoned him a few days prior when Jesus was arrested and crucified. Those who stayed by his side were mainly his women followers and his family members. And here on Sunday morning, the women were the ones who first went to see his tomb. But look at why they came, not to see if he had risen from the dead. They came to see his tomb, and according to other gospel accounts, they came to anoint Jesus' dead body with spices. And so this begs the question, why in the world did they, they come for this reason? And also, why in the world didn't any of Jesus' disciples come to his tomb on Sunday morning to see his resurrection? You know, Jesus had told them at least three times that the Jews and the Romans would kill him, but that he would rise from the dead on the third day. So why weren't the 12 disciples there to cheer on the most amazing event in the history of the world? Well, the Bible doesn't explicitly say why, but from what we can gather from different parts of the Gospels, we can guess as to why the disciples didn't come to see Jesus' resurrection. One guess is is that the disciples didn't understand Jesus when he said that he would rise again. They just didn't understand him. Before Jesus was arrested, when he spoke about his upcoming death and resurrection to his disciples, the gospel writers say that the disciples did not understand what he meant. The the idea of his resurrection just kind of went over their heads. And maybe that's why they didn't show up at the tomb on Sunday morning. Another guess is that the disciples were too scared to come to the tomb. Remember that the disciples had already fled the scene when Jesus was arrested and put to death. And John's gospel says that even after seeing the tomb on the on Sunday morning when the women came back and then they ran back to see it, even after that, the disciples didn't go straight to Galilee like Jesus told them to. Instead, the disciples locked themselves up in a house in Jerusalem because they were afraid of being killed just like Jesus was being, was, had been killed. They were afraid of being killed for being his followers. And so maybe they didn't come to Jesus' tomb because they were overcome with fear. And a third guess is that the disciples didn't come to the tomb because it was just so obvious that Jesus was dead. It was so obvious he was dead. You know, such a traumatic and violent death as his would have been impossible for anyone to come back from. Uh, Before he even went to the cross, the Romans violently flogged Jesus and very possibly flogged him two different times. And flogging itself was such a violent and deadly punishment that flogging alone had killed many a Roman criminal. And then after his flogging, the bleeding and beaten Jesus was forced to carry his own cross through Jerusalem and up outside of town to the place of the skull, Golgotha. And when he finally got there, the Roman soldiers nailed his hands and feet to the cross And then they stood it up vertically so that he would hang on the cross and die from blood loss and asphyxiation. And after hours of hanging on the cross, Jesus finally stopped breathing and he died. But the Roman soldiers wanted to be extra sure that Jesus was dead. And so uh, the gospel accounts say that they... The the Roman soldiers stabbed a spear into Jesus' side all the way into his heart. And when they did that, Jesus didn't moan. Jesus didn't flinch. Jesus was dead. And it was so obvious. It was so obvious to the soldiers and to everybody that was watching that Jesus was dead. And uh, it was so obvious that the, the soldiers did not even break his legs Uh, like they broke the legs of the other criminals on the cross to 
accelerate uh, their deaths. Needless to say, Jesus' death was overkill. And Jesus' followers and his family members who had seen all of these things happen to Jesus, they would have been terribly traumatized. Uh, the, the idea of Jesus being resurrected from the dead would have seemed impossible. And, and maybe it didn't even cross, cross their minds uh, that he could be resurrected because they were just so traumatized by this. We, we just don't know for sure. We don't know for sure why uh, Jesus' disciples uh, weren't the first ones at the tomb on Sunday morning. We don't know why for sure the women came to anoint his dead body instead of to see his resurrection. But what we do know is that at the break of dawn on that Sunday morning, there was a great behold coming. Verses 2 to 3 say, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So Matthew's telling us here, you guys, behold, look at this, you guys. There was a massive earthquake at Jesus' tomb on Sunday morning. And an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came down. And then the angel came to the, the, the stone in front of the tomb and he rolled it back all by himself. And then he sat on it. And no mere human could roll away a giant stone like that. Those stones weighed tons and tons. This was an incredible, an incredibly mighty angel of God. And the sight of this angel would take your breath away. His clothing was brilliantly white. It was white as snow. And, and, and his whole body, it says, was like lightning. It was flashing and shining with supernatural power. This angel was so awesome and fearful in appearance that the sight of the angel made these fierce, tough Roman soldiers literally shake in their boots and drop to the ground like dead men. And why did God do this? Why did he send this mighty angel to Jesus' tomb on Sunday morning? To declare on behalf of God that Jesus rose from the dead. To declare on behalf of God that Jesus rose from the dead. Verses 5 to 6 say, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. So this angel of God speaks for God. And through this angel, God declared to the world, and he declares to you and me today, that Jesus is not dead anymore. Jesus' body, it's not even in the tomb. Jesus exited the tomb in his glorious resurrection body while the tomb was still closed and sealed. Jesus' death for sinners is acceptable in God's sight. Jesus is no longer under humiliation and condemnation. Jesus is your risen Savior, and He has conquered the power of sin and Satan and death and hell for sinners and for the eternal glory of God's name. Jesus is who He said He was. That means every word of Jesus, every promise of Jesus is true. He has done what no one else has ever done. He has raised Himself from the dead. Jesus is God, and he holds the keys to life and to death. So the angel says, come into the tomb, women. See the place where his body was laid. And so the first behold in today's passage is behold, God sent a mighty angel from heaven to declare that Jesus rose from the dead. Get that? Behold, Jesus sent a mighty angel from heaven on behalf of God to declare that Jesus rose from the dead. Praise God. That's the first behold in today's passage. 
Now let's look for the next behold as we read the rest of what the angel of God told the women at the tomb. In Matthew 28, 7, the angel tells them, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. The angel commands the women to go quickly and to tell Jesus' disciples that Jesus has risen from the dead. And then the angels say, Behold, Jesus is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. And so the second behold in this passage is, Behold, you will see the resurrected Jesus. Behold, you will see the resurrected Jesus. Can, can you imagine how much joy that must have given those women? To, to hear that not only did Jesus rise, not only was he no longer dead, but also that they would get to see him back from the dead. Have you ever bought tickets to a concert to see one of your favorite musicians or bands live and in person? You know, almost always it's an amazing experience because now you finally get to see in flesh and blood these singers and musicians whose music has brought you so much joy. Well, to these women at the tomb, the prospect of seeing Jesus back from the dead was infinitely better than seeing any famous musician in the flesh. Jesus was their rabbi. Jesus was their Lord. They might have been thinking, but, you know, but he'd been so horrifically killed. How, how could he possibly be back from the dead? Are we going to see him? We are going to see him? He's going to meet us back home, back in Galilee? This is beyond mind-blowing. This is beyond shocking. And now at the end of verse 7, notice the reason the angel gives why the women should trust and obey him. The angel says, See, I have told you. The word see here is actually the same Greek word, edu, as behold, but in the ESV it translates it as see. And the point here is that the women should believe the angel's words because the angel speaks on behalf of God. And when the angel speaks, God speaks. And since God is the one telling us that Jesus has risen from the dead and that we should go spread that good news to others, then we should do it. The resurrection of Jesus is not merely an angel's declaration. The resurrection of Jesus is God's declaration to the entire world. Did you know that you're going to see Jesus back from the dead too? There's a day coming when you are going to meet the Lord face to face. The resurrected Jesus. You will meet him face to face. How do you feel about that? If you reject Jesus and choose not to follow him, I, I can't imagine you're looking forward to meeting him face to face someday. I, I would think that you're probably hoping that you won't meet him face to face, especially if what he says is true about what will happen to those who reject him. But if you are a believer in Jesus, can you even begin to imagine how awesome it is going to be to see Jesus in the flesh and to meet him face to face finally. And, and to know that you can approach him confidently in all of his glory. Because through his death and resurrection for you, he made you acceptable and pleasing to God. So you can come to him boldly now and with confidence. Knowing that he loves you and you're pleasing to him. What a day that's going to be when we see Jesus in his resurrected glory face to face. In light of the current coronavirus pandemic, I pray that all of us who are scared of suffering and dying would keep as our constant focus the thought of seeing Jesus in the flesh when we die. If you know the Lord, doesn't the thought of seeing him face to face make death less scary? Because when we, we look forward to seeing Jesus in the flesh, when we look forward to spending the rest of eternity with him after this life, we can, by God's spirit, truly say with the Apostle Paul, to live is Christ 
and to die is gain. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then don't go another day without him. Believe the good news that he lived, that he died for sin, that that he rose again for sinners like you and me. Because the truth is that we are miserable and helpless without him. And you need to be at peace with God. And the only way to be at peace with God is through his son, Jesus who died on the cross to make peace with God for you and for me. So change your mind about Jesus. Change your mind about what you're living for. Pray to the Lord Jesus today and trust in him. And you too can join Jesus's people in looking forward with joy to seeing Jesus one day face to face in his resurrected glory. Now let's look for the third behold in today's passage. It's the women run and tell the disciples about Jesus' resurrection. Matthew 28, 8 to 10 says, So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. So the third behold in this passage is behold, the resurrected Jesus offers you death defeating joy. Behold, the resurrected Jesus offers you death defeating joy. These women knew that they were going to see Jesus up in Galilee, but but they didn't expect to see him so soon on their way into Jerusalem. But Jesus met them and he said to them, greetings. And I love this Greek word for greetings. It also means rejoice. And so Jesus is greeting them with a blessing and with a reason for them to rejoice. And, and rejoice in exa- exactly what these women do when they meet him. In fact, they, they can't help to come up to Jesus, it says, and they bow down before him and they just take hold of his feet and they worship him. He really was alive. They, they, he could, they couldn't believe it. He really was the Christ. He really is the son of God. He really had defeated death. And so they worshiped him with great joy. And then Jesus tells them, do not be afraid. Because surely these women were trembling. Their worlds had been rocked by God that morning. You know, first with that huge, massive earthquake, and then seeing this mighty angel of God descend from heaven. And then this angel sits on the tomb uh, and, and talks to them. And now they're seeing and touching and talking to Jesus himself. I'm sure that the these women's bodies were trembling with fear and with adrenaline. And so Jesus tells them, don't be afraid. And then he tells them the same thing that his angel told them to go to his disciples and to tell them to go to Galilee where they will see him. Christian, do you know that Jesus tells you this Easter morning, rejoice because I've risen from the dead. How mind-blowing is it that Jesus greets us, his followers, not with a disappointed look on his face for how we failed him as his followers, but he greets us with a look of kindness and a look of pleasure on his face as he greets us and tells us to rejoice in him and in his resurrection. Rejoice, Christian, with your resurrected and living and reigning Savior and Lord Jesus today. Worship him with your words and by obeying him with your actions. Tell Jesus how awesome he is today. Sing to him. Rejoice that Jesus has defeated death, not just for himself, but for you who trust in him. And when God gives you the opportunity to tell others that Jesus rose from the dead, then rejoice and tell them too so that they might believe and so that they might rejoice too in the resurrection of Jesus. Behold, 
the resurrected Jesus offers you death-defeating joy today. So Matthew has told us how his women followers responded to Jesus' resurrection. And now Matthew tells us how the people who killed Jesus responded to his resurrection. Matthew 28, 11 to 15 says, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. The fourth behold in this passage is behold corrupt powers distort the good news of Jesus' resurrection. Behold, corrupt powers distort the good news of Jesus' resurrection. Earlier in Matthew, we read that the chief priests bribed Jesus by pay, uh, excuse me, bribed Judas by paying him money to betray Jesus. And now we read that they bribed the Roman soldiers to lie about what they had seen. The, the Jewish priests and elders told the Roman soldiers to spread the lie that Jesus' disciples came at night and stole Jesus' body from the tomb while the soldiers were asleep. And what we see here is that both the Jewish religious leaders and the Roman soldiers had a lot to lose if Jesus actually rose from the dead. So they distorted the message of Jesus' resurrection in order to protect themselves. They, they turned a blind eye to the actual possibility that Jesus rose from the dead like he said he would. And their own self-interest, their own self-preservation clouded their judgment. So they spread lies about what actually happened. And Matthew writes that sadly, instead of hearing and believing the good news about Jesus' resurrection, many Jews heard and believed the lies that Jesus' body was stolen. You know, <clears throat> even though many people praise the human race for how advanced we are and how we've progressed so much since Bible times. The reality is that morally, we have not advanced one bit in 2,000 years. Humanity is still as corrupt and selfish and deceiving as it's ever been. Just like those leaders 2,000 years ago, corrupt powers and self-interested people distort the gospel of Jesus today. And the three main forces that distort the gospel are the world, Satan, and our flesh. And so I want to briefly talk about how each of those powers distort the message of Jesus' death and resurrection. First, let's talk about the world and its worldly wisdom. <clears throat> Apart from the help of the Holy Spirit, the world around us will always believe the, that the message of Jesus' death and resurrection is foolish. Always. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 19 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And then a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 13, we read, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Unless the Holy Spirit of God overcomes our resistance to Jesus and opens our eyes to the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection, we will think the gospel is a foolish fable. And we know this is true because lots of people 
told Jesus during his earthly ministry, you know, just, just show us a, a sign and we'll believe you, Jesus. Just do a sign and we'll believe that you're God. <coughs> Yet, when Jesus showed them the greatest sign of all, his resurrection from the dead, they still refused to believe he was God. I've talked to several atheists who say the same thing that people in Jesus' day said. If, if Jesus would only show me a sign, then I would believe that he's real. Then I would believe in God. But if Jesus' resurrection wasn't enough for the people who actually witnessed it, then no sign will ever be enough for people today who demand a sign. Listen, the resurrection is the sign that God wants you to see and to believe. And so the world in its wisdom will always distort the gospel of Jesus. Second, Satan will always distort the gospel of Jesus. Satan is the ultimate liar. He and other demons constantly tell us lies. Satan is the one who said in the Garden of Eden, did God really say that this was true? Don't listen to God. He's not telling you the truth. And in the exact same way, Satan tells us today, did God really say through an angel at Jesus' tomb, see, I have told you that Jesus has risen from the dead? Don't believe God. It's not true. See, Satan will do whatever he can do to undermine our confidence in God and in the truthfulness of his words. And third, our own sinful flesh distorts the gospel of Jesus our flesh says, you know, if Jesus really is God, and if Jesus says that I am a corrupt, miserable sinner, and if Jesus demands that I worship him, then that is an insult to my ego. And that is an affront to my need for control. Jesus' death and resurrection show us how terribly messed up and wicked humanity is. Jesus his, his death and resurrection show us what horrific things had to happen in order to deliver us from the penalty for our wickedness. <clears throat> our wickedness is so offensive to God that the only way for us to be forgiven was for God to come to earth to fix our mess for us, which he did not have to do, but voluntarily did because he loves us immensely. And he did it by sending his only son, Jesus, on the cross to bear our sin on that cross and then to suffer God's wrath toward our sin, and then to be slaughtered and killed on the cross. And that is how he put our sin to death, by being killed for us. And either we will trust Jesus and get credit for the punishment that he already suffered for us, or we will reject Jesus and we will suffer the punishment for ourselves forever after this life. And that message offends us in our flesh. In our flesh, we come up with all sorts of reasons why this can't be true. This message can't be the truth. This, <clears throat> all sorts of reasons why God, he would be unjust to punish people this way. Except, of course, those people that we think are really deserving of punishment, right? So our flesh and Satan and the wisdom of the world around us will distort the good news of Jesus' resurrection until Jesus returns. Now, in light of those distortions, how remarkable and how powerful it is uh, that uh, the, must the good news, the gospel of Jesus be, of his death and resurrection, that this message has prevailed for two millennia despite innumerable efforts to squash it. The world and Satan and human flesh will not prevail over the resurrected Jesus. It will not prevail. Jesus and his gospel will, and his church will. And it's with this tone of victory that Matthew closes his gospel with a final behold. And this time, Jesus is the one who says, behold. Let's read Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So the fifth behold in today's passage is, Behold, follow the resurrected Jesus, and he will always be with you. Follow the resurrected Jesus, and he will always be with you. Jesus did not end his time on earth in humiliation or in hiding. Jesus ended his time on earth in exaltation and in power and in public. Jesus says here that he is the ultimate authority over everything that exists. He's the ultimate authority over the most distant star in the universe. He's the ultimate authority over the minuscule cells of the coronavirus. And he's the ultimate authority over you and over me. And as our resurrected Lord who is over us, Jesus commands us to go and make his disciples of all nations. A disciple of Jesus is someone who trusts in Jesus for eternal life and who then follows Jesus by seeking to obey all of his commands. And as we work hard to obey Jesus' commands, we do not do so to add to the finished work of Jesus that he already completed on the cross and in his resurrection. Uh, We don't seek to obey Jesus because we're afraid of his condemnation. Rather, as Jesus' disciples, we seek to obey Jesus because we're so thankful that he already accepted us when we first trusted in him. He made us acceptable. And so we seek to obey Jesus because we love him and because we want to worship him and because we want to bring glory to his name. We, we seek to obey Jesus because we believe that all of his commands are for our own good and for the good of the world and for the sake of God's glory. And Jesus commands us to trust him and to follow him. And he commands us to go to all the nations and to make more disciples of him. And so Jesus told us really specifically how to do this. He told us real specifically how to make disciples. First, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When a person trusts in Jesus Christ for eternal life, he or she should be baptized in water to signify his or her union with Jesus and his or her adoption into his family. And baptism is just a a joyous celebration. And then Jesus tells us in verse 20 to make disciples by teaching Christians to observe or obey everything that he's commanded us, all the the commands he's given us. And this is very important for all of us to hear And Jesus wants you to be his disciple. Jesus wants you to follow him. Jesus doesn't merely want you to pray a prayer and accept him in your heart so that you don't go to hell. Jesus' desire for you is much greater than that. Jesus wants to make your life holy, like he is holy. Jesus wants to transform you. He wants to transform what you value and how you think and how you live your life. Jesus wants you to set aside your old ways of worldly living like everybody else around you. And he wants to transform you into someone who does not live like the rest of the world, like all your peers. And the way that we become like Jesus in this life is by obeying his commands and by depending on his power as we do that. So those are two components. We obey his commands and we depend on his power to do that. You can only obey Jesus's commands first if if you know Jesus's commands and you can only know Jesus's commands if you read his commands and so you must read Jesus's word his bible which has his commands if you want to follow Jesus if you want to be a disciple of Jesus then start reading his word you know maybe a little bit each day there are several great bible plans out there on the internet just search Uh, Read the New Testament in 90 days or read the New Testament in a year and it'll divide it all up for you. Now, Jesus doesn't want us to read his word simply to absorb knowledge. He wants us to read his word so that our lives will be transformed. He wants our values and our lives to look like his values and his life. 
but we can't do this on our own power. Our lives cannot be transformed by our power. We, we have to rely on Jesus's power to do this in us. And so that means we're constantly asking him to do this in us. We're in constant communication with the Holy Spirit through prayer. We, we got to constantly talk to him and ask him to give us power to do things that are pleasing to him and to put to death those things in our lives that are displeasing to God. What a joy and a privilege to be a disciple of Jesus, to trust in him for eternal life, to know him personally as your friend, and to seek to obey him every day as you rest in his grace. So as we follow Jesus and make disciples together, Jesus gives us an awesome behold to to leave on. He says at the end of Matthew 28, 20, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Throughout the Bible, God shows his blessing and his goodwill toward certain people by being with them, by giving them his presence. And here the resurrected Jesus tells his followers, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Christian, Jesus promises you, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Isn't that great news? What an incredible blessing. You know, no matter what happens with this coronavirus crisis, no matter what crisis comes next, no matter what happens with our health, no matter what tragedies we have to endure in this life, Jesus is with us and he's for us if we are in him. What a great, great message and a living hope that we have. And so as you celebrate today the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would do so with the realization that his resurrection is not detached from you. Rather, I hope that you will celebrate his resurrection today with the realization that through faith in him, Jesus has attached you to himself and to his own death and to his resurrection. His victory over sin and Satan and death and hell is your victory too. Behold, Christian, Jesus has risen from the dead. He is with you always, and you will see him soon. Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we just want to worship you and praise you today. We ask you to help us by the Holy Spirit to do that. Thank you for the great news we have in you. You are the resurrected Lord, and we want all power and glory and fame to be yours forever. Please use us to worship you and to point others to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you guys, have a great day today. Celebrate uh, Jesus' resurrection with your friends and family, whoever you're with. And uh, I know it's a weird year because we're all kind of isolated, but Jesus is with us wherever we're at, and we're a family in Christ together. Thank you. God bless.